go in. And, and um, if you want to stop me, if I'm speaking too fast, if my English is not very good and you need me to mm -hmm. do this in French, I will try mm -hmm. or, or Mandarin. Um, <laughs> I only, I only know American, so uh, <laughs> I will do my okay. best. Um, mm -hmm. Let me share my screen. And so um, what you had asked is for the talk on um, guidelines. Ooh, I can't, uh, hold on. There it goes. Uh, guidelines and update. And, and so those are two separate talks. So I put them together and I hope that's okay. I figured it would be easier to do that. And so the talks are together. And what I, I wanted to do is I, I've looked up where you are. I, I found out where your, your country is, um, although I think I knew before, but I thought I would tell you where Norfolk is as well. So uh, I'm in Norfolk, Virginia, and we're in the, obviously in the United States in the, the state of Virginia, which is in the orange. We're down in the South, Eastern aspect, um, close to the ocean. Norfolk is, is known for our, our military history. We have a lot of uh, naval bases and, and Navy history here. It's the largest uh, military base actually on the East Coast of the United States. We're also known for some history. The uh, American Revolution was um, it ended in Yorktown, which was about 45 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. Um, this is our, our harbor um, at night, and then we have Virginia Beach that's just uh, about 20 minutes from where I live. So this is kind of where I am. And this is the hospital that I, I practice at in the medical school, and um, I obviously this is the first time we're meeting, but hopefully we will be able to uh, share many more of these conferences, and hopefully I can come visit you, and maybe sometime you can come visit us. So just wanted to show you where we were. I don't have any disclosures for this. Um, so what I would thought we would talk about is kind of an, use the AUA guidelines a little bit and talk about stricture disease and talk about considerations of what we would do and then how we would manage some of the, the diseases in the strictures. So when we think about urethral strictures, we need to consider many different things when we're we're thinking about what um, surgical procedures and non-surgical procedures we would do. Obviously, if the patient has a traumatic stricture, if it was a straddle injury or a pelvic fracture, you really should not offer them a urethrotomy. You should offer them a reconstruction. If it's infectious, the treatment options will be different. If the patient has lichen sclerosis, um, as in this patient, you're going to offer them something different. And then obviously, if it's iatrogenic, um, we, may, we may have different uh, surgical repairs or procedures to consider. We also need to consider location. So this patient had a pelvic fracture and has a pelvic fracture, um, urethral distraction or, or injury. And so obviously, again, the treatment of a pelvic fracture or posterior injury is different than, than an anterior injury. We need to look at the length. Shorter strictures do better with uh, minimally invasive procedures like endoscopy, but longer strictures will need more of an open reconstruction. The caliber of the stricture, it depends on the grass or what we're going to do. If they've had previous treatments, we wanna consider non-transecting or vessel sparing, and then radiation and other things can actually affect our treatment. The other thing that I think though is important and in the United States, we don't always consider this, is the other characteristics that you have to deal with more commonly than we do. Um, you know, in the United States, we don't really think too much about the cost for the patient because most of our insurance companies pay for that. We don't think about their time off work or if they need to have a catheter. Obviously, we, th we talk to them about, you know, post-operative complications like erectile dysfunction, um, and we talked to them about the recovery, but again, it could be different because many of our patients have insurance, their work is going to give them time off, where for you, these patients have to usually pay, they are taking time off work, and that can be a big consideration. We also need to look at the long-term outcomes when we talk to our patients, but most of the time, this is a patient's choice. The patient needs to decide what works for them, 
and what, what's better for them. And, and, and that's how we make these decisions. When we look about urethral strictures, we think about location because the treatment of this stricture is going to be different than the treatment of this stricture. And it's gonna be different than the treatment of this stricture. And so location of the stricture really determines what we can offer and our success rates. More proximal strictures obviously do much better with excision and primary anastomosis, but more distal strictures, you're gonna to need to consider some tissue um, transfer like a graft or a flap. Most of the, I mean, obviously we wanna consider the different parts of the urethra, the penile, the fossa navicularis, the meatus, the penile urethra, bulbar urethra, membranous urethra, prostatic urethra, and bladder neck. And again, those different areas will determine the different treatment options we have. But when we look at our goals, our goals is for our patients to have normal function, unobstructed voiding and normal, maintain their normal sexual function. And I always tell our patients, this is how I expect them to void as they are leaving my office after their repair. This is, I, this is the ultimate, uh, obviously. This was just a definition that I found actually in a paper on a female urethral reconstruction. But a urethral stricture is a fixed anatomic narrowing of the urethra such that the lumen will not accommodate instrumentation without disruption of the mucosa. I think it's a nice definition. There's many people that try to define certain things, but I thought this really defines truly what a stricture is. So when we think about strictures, um, obviously we want to talk about what is our workup and how we're going to manage these. And we're going to consider management by either um, initially doing some type of evaluation. We'd usually do a retrograde urethrogram. Sometimes we'll do a voiding cystourethrogram. Sometimes we'll do a cystoscopy. And rarely do we do ultrasound. Now, the other things is the clinicians should not plan non-emergent treatment without knowing the length and the caliber and location of the stricture. And I think that's very important because a lot of our colleagues will not um, have this information when they proceed. And, and I know, again, for you, it's difficult because your patients have to pay for this. Where our patients can get this, you, yours have to go to a radiologist and have these done where our patients can, I do mine in my own office. So in our evaluation, we do a retrograde urethrogram, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second. We'll do a VCUG. We, as I said, we may or may not do a cystoscopy. This is a, a picture of someone who's had radiation in a previous repair. And in that patient, I think cystoscopy is beneficial. And then obviously ultrasound. So let's talk about retrogrades. So a retrograde urethrogram is really important in my mind. And it's something that I, I really get frustrated because many people will do the surgery without a retrograde urethrogram. And I don't understand because you, you don't take out a kidney without doing a CAT scan or you don't do a partial nephrectomy without doing a CAT scan. Well, the same should be said for a urethral stricture. We need to know the length of the stricture to understand our success rates. So our patient needs to be in the correct position. He needs to be oblique about 45 degrees. He needs to have the penis on stretched. You want to be able to see the obturator um, that's closed and one is partially open. And then you want to inject contrast. You want to see the full length of the urethra and you want the urethra to get all the way through into the bladder because you need to be able to see the full length of the, the urethra. You're gonna see some narrowing at the prostatic urethra as you see here. But this is, this is described as a bad retrograde because we don't see proximal. This is more than likely the external sphincter, but we don't know that. We don't know if he has scar tissue proximal to here. And then when we do the x-ray correctly, we actually can see that, yes, this is the sphincter. This is the prostatic urethra and the bladder is here. When we do these x-rays, I actually do all of mine myself. So when I am operating on a patient, I personally will do their retrograde urethrogram because again, I think this is the most important aspect of my planning for me to have the perfect x-ray. Here are a couple of retrograde urethrograms and I'm sure the two of you probably see these in your office all the time. These were pictures from my travel to Senegal, Zimbabwe, Cape Town. And when I show up, 
I don't know what this patient, this patient has, I don't know if the stricture is just this, what happens in his penile urethra? Or in this patient, is he completely obliterated from his penile scrotal junction all the way? I don't know. So to try to uh, plan a surgery, it's almost impossible. These gentlemen, again, are strictures that you really don't know what you're going to be doing. And then this, this is a, a, a rug in a VCUG on a young gentleman who had had three previous repairs for his pelvic fracture injury. And when we were in communication in Harari, they said, well, he's got a, as you can read, I think it says a four centimeter stricture. But when you actually look at the x-ray, his penis wasn't on stretch. This actually, his urethra was obliterated at the penoscrotal junction. So there was no way to be able to repair this gentleman. And so it's important, again, to have the appropriate images before you start your surgery. Because if I would have tried to repair him, I wouldn't have been able to, and I would have put him through an unneeded operation. He ended up getting a continent catheterizable stoma and has done well, at least I've told he's done well. I think one of the other things that we all fail to do at times is truly have an honest conversation with our patient. Most of the time, we know that urethrotomy or a dilation will not cure our patient. It may help them for a short time, maybe even a year or two. But most of the time with bad strictures, it will not help. And therefore, it's okay to do the procedure as long as the patient understands that's what we are offering them, a management where he's going to have to come back and do this again. Or we can talk about a cure where we would actually do a reconstruction and hopefully fix the patient. I just wanted to go through some papers that have looked at urethrotomy in, in um, data and try to just kind of show what the, the true data is. So this is a paper that's almost always quoted. It's Dr. Pansadora, his paper, and they looked at about 450 patients, as you can see. And as you can see from their patients, it's very similar to most urethral stricture patients. A few congenital, some traumatic, some infection, some atrogenic, but many of them are unknown and probably are, are traumatic and they just don't know. When we look at the results of urethrotomy, you can see our success rates if it's infectious or if it's iatrogenic, they're about 40%. Traumatic strictures probably have close to a 0% success rate. They're 16% here. They've had one of their six patients that it worked. But again, unknown 40%. Um, so the success rates are actually nowhere near as good as sometimes we think. Well, then what they did was they broke their patients down into if the caliber of the stricture is less than 15 French, their success rate was 34%. If it's more, it's probably close to 70. Some would argue you don't even need to do a urethrotomy on a stricture that's more than 15 French, because that's, that's like putting in a 16 French catheter, and that I would consider relatively normal. If you look at the length of the stricture, if it's greater than a centimeter, success rates are less than 20%. If it's shorter than a centimeter, for the first time, it's 70%. And for the second time, it's 20%. So again, it's a re that's a reasonable option. You have a chance of curing that patient, and then you wouldn't need to do another operation. So a short ball bar stricture, we offer a urethrotomy. What about recurrent strictures? Well, again, primary strictures have a, overall have about a 50% success rate. But if we look at them on redos, the success rates are actually significantly you're looking at less than 16%. And again, it determines the length in the, the location. When we look at location again, after multiple urethrotomies, you may, it may work the first time or the, I mean, and the second time, but it's never gonna work the third and fourth time. Your success rates are zero. And many patients aren't told that. They undergo four or five or six dilations or urethrotomies, and that just doesn't seem to, to work. And I, as long as a patient knows that they're not gonna work, that's okay. Dr. Barbagli looked at this as well. And this is his patient characteristics. He had 130 some patients. But what he looked at was he looked at the flow, the, so Euroflow. And as you can see on his chart, if the flow is less than five milliliters per second, his success rates are poor. If he also looked at length, and again, if length is greater than two centimeters, or for sure three centimeters, again, success rates are poor. And in their conclusion, they said, 
patients with a flow rate greater than eight, you should consider maybe a urethrotomy. If the flow is less than five, don't. And anything longer than two centimeters, you should not consider a urethrotomy. Now, those are the reasons why we need to do a good retrograde urethrogram before we address the stricture, because then we can actually have an honest conversation with the patient and say, hey, we can do this, but it's not going to work. But if that's what you can afford and that's what you want to do, it'll open you for some time. And then we can come up with another plan. Or if you want to have a reconstruction, then we can offer that. So when we think about urethral reconstruction, again, less than a centimeter or urethrotomy, less than a centimeter, 70% um, success rate, greater than three, 20%, very poor success rate in lichen sclerosis, recurrent stricture, penile urethra doesn't work, and then any traumatic strictures, really a urethrotomy doesn't work. And if you look at the AUA guidelines, they say you, could, you can offer these operations if the stricture is less than two centimeters in bulbar. Besides that, they recommend not offering them at all. So then what else can we offer? What kind of reconstructions can we offer? So open reconstruction and primary anastomosis. Again, looking at the AUA guidelines, surgeons should offer urethroplasty for patients with a penile stricture because endoscopic surgery does not work. And they should also offer urethroplasty as a treatment option for strictures greater than two centimeters, given that the low success rate of a urethrotomy or a dilation for any stricture greater than two centimeters. So again, our surgical options. We mostly will do a single procedure, but there are some times when they have a bad stricture, we may have to do a staged procedure. We could consider an excision in primary anastomosis, or we could do tissue transfer. We could do transecting versus non-transecting. We may have to do some type of extra tissue, so a graft or a flap. When we consider grafts, we could use buccal grafts, we could use lingular grafts, post-auricular. People have described rectal or bladder, and now obviously there's some tissue engineering that we're, we're using. The types of flaps, mostly it's penile or scrotal skin. We don't usually use scrotum anymore because of the hair bearing aspects. And flaps have really not, I wouldn't say they've kind of gone out of favor over the last few years. Let's look at the type of strictures or the, the type of repair for proximal ball bar strictures. So if we just break the, the urethra down into segment, a stricture less than two centimeters in length will almost always have an excision in primary anastomosis. So looking at this x-ray, this patient, I would offer excising the stricture and putting the two ends back together. And how we would do that is we would make our perineal incision. We dissect down to the corpus spongiosum or the urethra. We would mobilize the urethra. As you can see in the figure down here, we'd find the stricture, we'd excise it, we'd do a spatulated anastomosis and put the two ends back together. And if you look at success rates with a primary excision and primary anastomosis, success rates are somewhere between 90 and 95%, if not higher, with good long-term data. So that's a very good operation. What about this gentleman? This stricture may be a little bit longer. You might be able to do an excision in primary anastomosis, but you may also want to consider a graft. You also want to discuss, and I'll briefly discuss, a vessel sparing or non-transecting. So in this, this is a gentleman who had radiation and I'm worried about his blood supply because of the radiation. And so we would do a vessel sparing. And how we would do that is we would identify the bulbal urethral arteries. We would put a vessel loop around those and, and get them out of our field, so to speak. We would then incise the stricture and excise it. And then we would just put our two ends back together, just like we would on a primary transecting but we would keep the blood supply intact to the corpus spongiosum so that we would not worry about the distal um, blood supply coming back through the sponge. This gentleman, obviously his stricture is longer and he'll require a graft of some sort. So in this gentleman, we would consider doing a um, onlay. We would mobilize the corpus spongiosum. We would do a urethrotomy, make an incision in the urethra. I do most of my grafts dorsally. Um, I find it better because I can spread my graft and I can get a, a better 
fixation of the graft on the graft bed. And then we would do, we would run both ends. What about if it's a little bit dist more distal, maybe in the mid bulbar urethra? Again, you could consider an excision in primary anastomosis, but it needs to be a short stricture because you cannot mobilize it as much. What about here? This is a longer stricture and it's tighter. So there's a segment of that we need to excise because you see it's almost obliterated. So we're gonna need to do an augmented anastomosis with a dorsal graft on length, just as in this patient. Again, tighter stricture, a little bit longer. Here again, make our midline incision. We would come down under the, the corpus spongiosum or the urethra. We would excise our stricture. We would do a anastomosis ventrally, and then I place my graft dorsally and then secure the graft to the, to the corpus spongiosum. When we look at success rates, success rates here are probably 80 to 95%, depending on which paper you look at. Not as high as an excision in primary anastomosis, but, but pretty good still. What about um, a one stage onlay versus a two stage reconstruction? So what about someone with a panurethral stricture? So Dr. Kalkarni was the, one of the first to actually describe this. And he described what is now called the Kalkarni procedure, but it's a dorsal graft panurethral stricture. And, and when you looked at his first paper, he had about 117 patients. Most of these patients had LS, 70% of them had lichen sclerosis. Some of them were due to catheters. There was some tra trauma and some failed hypospadias. But if you look at their mean stricture length, they were all long strictures, 14 centimeters. About 83, 84% of his patients were a success, 15 to 16% were failures. Here's some pictures from his paper. So he makes a midline incision he inverts the penis through the midline incision, and he does a one-sided dissection of the corpus spongiosum. He then will do a urethrotomy. He'll open up the urethra, and he'll take his buccal graft. He'll sew the buccal graft to the urethra on one side, and then he'll sew the graft on the opposite side. And there's the graft being sewed. I've actually struggled with his exact approach, and so I've made a slight modification. This is a patient of mine. And as you can see, he's had really, he has really bad lichen sclerosis, um, quite difficult to fix. So we made a, I usually make a midline incision now, and this I made a, um, a lambda incision, but my incisions are now midline. But I also made a, a circumcising incision and I brought his penis through the perineum. This gives me a better stretch of the penis so I can actually pull the penis up and get full stretch. I'll harvest my buccal graft. And I can actually, doing this, I do a bilateral. He only dissects one side, I do both. And I'm able to easily get underneath the glands and dissect up into the fossa navicularis. I then obtained my, my buccal graft. And this is my, so I buccal graft, and I, I ended up putting another graft here as well. And so this gentleman, this is his post-operative film. Um, so it worked actually very well. I will tell you that, just to be complete, honest, and transparent, he developed a meatal stricture down the road, and he does do meatal dilation periodically to keep that open. So what if you have a tight stricture that's um, long and tight? So your options are, you could do a tubularized graph. The tubularized graphs have close to a 0% success rate, so that's not a good option. You could use a flap and tubularize that. But again, tubularized flaps have about a 50% success rate. So not necessarily a great option. And if the patient has lichen sclerosis, you really can't use genital skin because success rates are 20%. So Joel Gelman, one of our fellows from Norfolk, he actually was the first to describe a dorsal and ventral graft. So this is a gentleman with a tight stricture. He's mobilized the corpus spongiosum. He incises and does a urethrotomy. He will then excise the stricture off of the sponge, but as you can see, he leaves the sponge intact. He'll then take a buccal graft and he'll put it on the sponge here. So the sponge 
the corpus spongiosum is now a graft bed um, for the graft. He'll then take a buccal graft and place it dorsally. And so he has a ventral and dorsal graft. When you look at his success rates on his initial paper, he had a, um, 17 of the 18 patients were cured and he had about four year follow-up. So there's a good long-term data. This is a patient of mine. He had a urolume, which was a stent that was placed back in the 90s. It's currently no longer available. Um, this would be another patient though you could consider this for. So here's where the patient's urolume is. And as you can see, he's completely obliterated where the urolum was. We, we dissected the urolum off of the sponge. So I left again the corpus spongiosum, but the stricture, here is his normal um, mucosa, his normal urethral mucosa. And then this is his sponge. And as you can see, this is our, again, our graft bed. So we took a large graft from his cheek we placed our buccal graft on our corpus spongiosum and on our um, corporal bodies as our graft bed. And then we sewed it back together. Um, and as you can see, here's us sewing one side of our graft and then we'll sew the other side. Um, I followed this gentleman for about six or seven years. He was in his mid to late seventies. And he, at six years, he lived about eight hours from me. And I told him to stop driving to see me because he was doing well but he never had a recurrence. Um, we do this quite frequently and have actually been very happy with our success rates with the dorsal and ventral repair. So here's a case just to kind of look at uh, different cases and, and how we would uh, manage certain cases. And this is one case that uh, it's a difficult case for us reconstructive urologists because we wanna make everybody perfect. So this gentleman had lichen sclerosis he had failed numerous surgeries and it had a number of flaps and grass. And as you can see, his urethra is completely um, scarred. He's got urethral stricture all the way back. And actually this is probably scar, there's some scar tissue here as well, but it's dilated because of the, the strictures that he has along the way. You also can see by looking at him, he's a large man. He's got a large panis, some large thighs. And so the operation will not necessarily be easy. So the options were, he could catheterize himself. We could talk to him about doing dilations. We could try to do a single stage reconstruction or a staged reconstruction. But the reason to have this, this patient is to talk about perineal urethrostomy. And I do understand that sometimes that is not culturally okay. And there are some times that we would consider um, not doing it for cultural reasons. But this gentleman, I think, was a good a good patient for a perineal urethrostomy. Here we made a perineal incision. As you can see, this is that dilated area that was that looked normal, but he has squamous metaplasia here. Because of that, we took a buccal graft and I did a buccal graft onlay and then put him back together um, with a buccal graft. When we look at success rate with perineal urethrostomy, Success rates are actually approximately 70 to 85%, probably not as good as we initially thought they were. And sometimes you will need to do a perineal flap, you'll need to do a buccal graft, you'll need to do something to kind of transfer tissue to kind of help with that. So when we talk about urethral reconstruction, we talk about either doing excision and primary anastomosis with very short stricture as close to the sphincter, this is a great option. For traumatic strictures, or perineal fra or pelvic fractures, this is your only option. You really should not consider a dilation and rarely do you need to use a graft. When we talk about grafts, we usually use a buccal graft. We almost always will do this dorsally in Norfolk. I think it gives better results, um, at least in my hands. And we may have to augment our anastomosis if it's long. And then again, penile urethra, we could do short or long. But I think it's really important not to forget about our perineal urethrostomy. Now I have, um, and then this is a picture of, of what our patients hopefully are, are avoiding. There's not as many mountains that look like this in, in uh, Norfolk, but maybe in uh, out west and in, in Africa. I think this is a perfect slide to um, kind of remind all of us why we went into medicine. You know, I think we're very lucky. I think we're very lucky to do what we do. And, and um, 
we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And I think um, this was by Winston Churchill. And I don't know if, if you know the history of Winston Churchill. He was a very colorful, colorful person. Many of his quotes we cannot put on a slide, but this one I think is actually a, a, a quote that we can use. This is my email, and I think you, you have my email, but I'm available anytime for emails about cases. I'm happy to share my cell phone, um, and you can WhatsApp me. I, this morning, I was talking to somebody from Ethiopia, Senegal, Trinidad, and Nigeria. So, I mean, I'm, I'm truly happy to answer any questions that you have about cases, send me x-rays and, and whatever you feel is, is appropriate or you need help with. I do have, I have other slides, but um, I wasn't necessarily um, going to do the other talks, but I, I mean, I'm happy to, but I, I thought we would, I would try to keep it a little bit shorter so we maybe have some time to, to answer questions if that's okay. Thank you so much, Dr. McCammon. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Kurt. Thank you. Thank you, really. Of course. Um, um, I have a question. You, you mentioned uh, that you are the one who does the, um, the retrograde, you, you retrogram for all your patients? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so I'm is very it, lucky. It... <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> you, you, you get to, to make the diagnosis correctly before, before planning any intervention, any surgery. Correct. Um, so mainly your patients, do, do, do you have patients who are coming for a reduced surgery or uh, most of the time uh, they are coming for the first time? So most of our patients um, are coming for redos. Um, we for are redos. a referral center. So um, we'll, we'll get local patients for their first reconstruction, but we get a lot of referrals from outside for redos. So according to, to what you've seen, uh, what are the, the, the common mistakes that you, 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 you think are the cause of the, the, the reduce? That that's, a great, that's, a, yeah. that's a great question. It's a very good mm -hmm. question. So I think sometimes some of the redos, so it's gonna depend on where the, the stricture is located. So let's just start with pelvic fractures because that's something you see a lot of, I, I assume, at least with my mm -hmm. experience um, in Africa so far, you see more of that than we do. Um, and so pelvic fracture injuries, the biggest problem I see is all the stricture is not excised. So you, you get in, you identify the area of stricture, you're excited because that's a difficult dissection already, right? Um, you find the, the proximal aspect, and then a lot of people will open it up, but they, they excise some of the scar, but they don't excise all of the scar. And without excising all the scar, you don't have a healthy tissue to sew to. The other aspect that I think is always a concern on pelvic fracture injuries is mobilization of the, the distal corpus spongiosum or urethra. And when, if it's not mobilized enough, it'll be placed on tension. And so you'll have the urethra pulling back. And so the two, two reasons for failures on posterior urethras are not enough mobilization and excising of the proximal scar and not enough mobilization distally. Because that operation should have a success rate the first time of 90 or 95%. Because it truly is an operation where once you excise that scar and put your two ends back together, you should have a very high success rate. Unfortunately, as you know, that's not always the case, um, mm -hmm. especially I've, we, uh, looked, we published a paper in Senegal a, a few years ago, and it showed, unfortunately, their success rate was about 12% on doing urethral reconstruction. And it wasn't because they're, they're outstanding surgeons. I mean, they're some of the best surgeons I've worked with. It's just they haven't had the opportunity 
to learn about mobilizing in those types of aspects. Um, does that make sense on pelvic fractures? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. I think so, that's the, the 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 most difficult, actually, the most yeah, yeah. difficult eutroplasty to, yeah, yeah. to perform. Yeah. But actually, yeah, how about the? Uh huh. Oh no. So um, once you get comfortable, it's actually the, one of the easiest to perform. It truly yeah. is um, <laughs> one of the the easier for a, a virgin case. For a redo, mm -hmm. it's very hard. Very very hard. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. but the first repair, it's actually, it's a wonderful case because the distal dissection is virgin. There's no scar tissue there. Mm -hmm. You get mm -hmm. to the, the membranous urethra where the, you'll, you'll have your plate of scar, which is where the difficulty is. But then mm -hmm. once you excise that, it's actually, it's a, it's a nice case. You were going to ask something else. Sorry. Uh, I, I was going to ask uh, about the uh, other location of the strictures. For of course, the the the, the pelvic fracture is uh, is a, 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 a type of stricture on, on on its own. How about the other um, common strictures like the bubble bubble strictures? Yeah. Well, so what when, are the when, common mistakes that yes. you you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we talk about anterior strictures, um, I think there are a couple common things that we see. Again, one, patients don't come in with the correct um, x-rays before surgery. And so we may have underestimated their stricture length and therefore maybe have planned the wrong operation. And people will then unfortunately stick to what they planned. You know, if they haven't planned to harvest buckle graft, or maybe that's not a skill set they have, and they don't have their plastic ENT surgeon to help them, they're not going to, they're, they're going to do what they know, number one. Um, number two, if it's a longer stricture that we're going to do an excision in primary anastomosis, sometimes, again, we don't mobilize enough distally, and therefore, we place our anastomosis on tension, and, and again, you know, when you think about um, reconstructive principles, tension-free, preserving normal tissue and blood flow, I mean, those are obviously some of our more uh, obviously important um, principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I find, especially here, and I've actually seen when I've, I've been fortunate to travel and, and work elsewhere, is on the proximal strictures, proximal ball bar strictures, people get very nervous about dissecting to the sphincter. And so what, what you see is, um, I'm actually gonna share my slides again, cause I wanna show a, show a picture just to try to explain this better. But um, what you see then is patients will, or, or physicians will do the operation, um, they'll fix the, this the wide caliber stricture but they won't actually this is the wrong one i'm going to get a different one sorry they won't actually go all the way to the the stricture and so what let me let me show you and i apologize i need to show you the the mm -hmm. exactly what i mean um uh, where is my talk i just gave Oh, there. Must be this one. No, maybe not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I will find it. Maybe okay, it's okay. <laughs> I will. I will find it. No, but I, I think it's important because I, I see this quite. Fr oh, I know what I did. I will get it. <laughs> um, I see this quite frequently that they they misdiagnose how bad the stricture is. Um, can you see my slides or no? No, you haven't yet shared okay. the, right. the so screen. Let, yeah. let me, yeah, let me share. Um, and it's a slide I've already showed you. So it's, um, it's one you've just seen, but um, you can see them now, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, when it's, it's the last stricture that I, that I showed you, the one that we did the perineal urethrostomy on. So when you look at this x-ray, when I looked at this x-ray, I'm like, well, he has stricture all the way here to his fossa navicularis. He's got 
this is all more, more than likely stricture. This is stricture, here's stricture. And I looked at this and I said, maybe that's stricture, maybe that's not, I don't know. But when we then did the reconstruction, as you can see, this is all squamous metaplasia. He's dilated, it's, it's, it's open on this stricture because when he voids, his bladder is pushing a lot of pressure, it's hitting this tight stricture and it's causing a post, it's causing a dilation of this, this urethra proximal because of the pressures his bladder is generating. But once we take that stricture away, this will scar up. And you can tell when, when patients have this squamous metaplasia, you really need to either excise it or put your grafts all the way to normal mucosa. And so a lot of people won't do that, you know, because that's that would have dilated or would have bougied to about 28 mm -hmm. French. And but when we take the obstruction away, it would have completely obliterated. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that, unfortunately, uh, the first uh, one of my first buckle grafts, I wasn't aggressive enough and I did not dissect proximal enough. And so most of the time when I. Um, when I have these patients, I will spatulate all the way through to the membranous urethra if that's where the squamous metaplasia goes. So I think people don't dissect enough distally to, to get that. Finally, okay. I think when you're doing a buccal graft, you have to make sure it's spread and fixed on whatever your graft bed is. Because if you don't, I think that makes it quite difficult because the blood supply won't be there and it won't hold it. Yeah. So those are some of the common mistakes that, that I see. Thank you. Thank you for answering my questions. Yeah, of course. Um, and I don't I know will, if Dr. Yeah. I will put in the chat function my cell mm -hmm. phone, um, which is mm -hmm. my WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And I truly am in free anytime um, you want to send me a WhatsApp. Um, I know IVU also has a consultation program and, and you can mm -hmm. reach out to Katie for that, um, which is also actually works. Um, but however, however you would want it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm free any, you know, may not, may not answer it if it's two in the morning, my time, <laughs> but I will answer it the next sure. day for sure. <laughs> I, I, will, um, I, I, I have a case. Maybe I will, I will need your, your opinion when I get the, 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 the images for the, the, sure. the retrograde yeah. retrogram. It's, it's a patient, uh, a 50, 52 years old male patient who, who has been undergoing a uh, urethral structure treatment for last for the last 15 years so he told he he's had about 10 surgeries some some in in in, in nairobi he's had surgeries in in uh, in rwanda and he also uh his last surgery was uh two years ago and he had a a graft according to what he told me he he got a buckle graft in india and and now he's symptomatic again. Uh, I had to 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 do a cystostomy. I, I gave him an SPC and sent him for for a, a uh, images. Mm -hmm. So maybe for this one, he I think he will be a candidate for a perineal <laughs> urethrostomy after. I, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> after I, having I, these uh... multiple surgeries. <laughs> I think you'd be a good candidate for perineal. Uh, I, I agree a thousand percent. I think I, mm. I love the fact that you said that right away because as we as doctors and surgeons, we think we can do everything, right? Meanwhile, mm. the mm. other person just doesn't know what they're doing. And exactly. the whole time I'm listening to that story, I'm thinking he does need something simple because yeah. many people have tried, even if they weren't good, and I'm not saying they are, I'm sure they were good, Mm. that tissue is scarred and traumatized yeah, it's scarred. And yes it's yes, going to be yes. yeah so i think a perineal orthostomy depending on what his images look like is probably the right answer. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah i have i have already discussed this about with him <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> i was like yeah let's do images and see how how bad it is but definitely after these multiple surgeries 
a perineal retrostomy is better for you. And even sometimes considering a, and I know this is difficult because of catheter issues, but like continent catheterizable stomas. I mean, we, I've actually, I think I mentioned there was a patient, I showed the x-ray, the pelvic <laughs> fracture. I mean, that patient, there was no way we could reconstruct him. And he was, I, what I, no, that was a younger, he was 18, but there's no way that patient could be reconstructed. Um, and he needs a continent catheterizable stoma, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. it's not a great option, obviously, and especially because catheters are difficult to come by for you. I, I, I unfortunately do know the, the pitfalls that you have, mm -hmm. but um, I, I don't have another option. He could live with a, cat, a suprabubic tube, which is terrible for a, an 18, 20 year old young. Yeah, mm -hmm. man. So, so he ended up getting a, a kind of catheterizable stoma. We did a couple when we were there, um, but yeah, sometimes you need to know what, when you can and when you can't and when you should and when you shouldn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. I don't know if Dr. Reveria uh, has some questions, comments. I think you're on mute. Yeah, he's, he's on mute. Oh, there you are. Mm -hmm. It's okay now? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have some question and I want to ask if after surgery or erythrotomy, do, do you do the dilatation or no? There is a place of dilatation. Huh? I, I do, do I do the... Erythrodilatation. You oh, I try not mm -hmm. to. Um, uh. When I when I talk to my patients, if I do dilation, yes. But if I do a reconstruction, I try to uh, success is without dilation. If my patient is having to dilate, then that in my mind is a failure. So, okay. Yeah. I, I ask if if uh, in front of for for and structure. Of yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, for uh, sure. Ask if, uh, yes, the, there is a place of the rotation or not. No, I, I think there is. I again I think it's important that we know our own limitations. And I have uh, patients where I say, you know what, we have tried, this has failed. Now we need to do dilation. You can either cath and try to dilate yourself or come in and we can do that. I don't like when that happens, obviously, but yes, for sure there are times when that is appropriate. Okay. And uh, for using the, um, the, the big cafra graft. Yes. Uh, which, uh, which the indication is the, is the first surgery or the recurrent because of, uh, if you're using it directly, the tissue are not good. And uh, so, yeah, I think um, it, it depends on their stricture, the length, the location. I've done grass for the first time when, when it's a longer stricture um, or more distal. If it's a recurrent, I think the graft beds are okay. I do think that if doing a buccal graft on a recurrent stricture is okay. And, and I don't think there's much of a problem, especially dorsally. Ventrally, the corpus spongiosa may be more scarred on a recurrent stricture. So then I, I would be more worried about going ventral. Um, but as I said, I do all my, my strictures on my grafts dorsally. So I think, um, I think it makes sense to, to do a buccal graft if you need, but yeah, I, I use buccal grafts either um, primary or for recurrence. Okay. And the last, uh, can you send us the, the presentation? <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. yeah I don't <laughs> mind at all. Much. I always Thank share. And I just realized I didn't put my plus one for my, my WhatsApp. So I did add that and just sent that because I'm in the US. So it is a plus one from my WhatsApp. Okay.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. McCammon, and thank you also for both of you for coming and making the lecture possible. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, last last time's uh, presentation on erectile dysfunction. Dr. Mara hasn't yet shared that that with us. Maybe Kathy will, will transfer the, the message. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll ask her. Okay. Okay. You know, okay. I will try to send it this weekend, but if you don't get it from me, just email me. Okay. If I sure. forget, <laughs> I've got a bunch of things I'm doing. Just email me. Okay. I don't mind at all, or send me a message, whatever. Okay. Mm. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Of course. Mm. And if yeah, you need anything else, everyone. just let me know. Bye. Sure. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks, uh, have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye-bye.